We finally got JWST data about TRAPPIST-1. An Earth-sized rogue planet has been found, and more information about China's plans for the moon. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Pretty much every week, someone asks me, when are we going to see JWST data of the TRAPPIST-1 system? And if you go back in history, looking through the observation logs from JWST, they recorded that data several months ago. So the astronomers have been poring over it, trying to understand it. And finally, this week, we got the data we've been waiting for sort of we, we got one like there are seven earth sized planets in the trappist one system several of which orbit within the habitable zone of this star but this week we got one the first one trappist 1b and it's like the worst one the planet's about the same size and mass as the Earth, but it orbits so close to the star that it receives about four times as much solar radiation than the Earth does, which makes it kind of like a Earth-sized Mercury. The average temperature on the surface of this planet is about 225 Celsius. That's hot. Mercury is about 425 Celsius, so not as hot as Mercury, but still, definitely not in the habitable zone. One of the big questions that astronomers had was, does this planet have any kind of atmosphere? And from what they can tell, the answer is no. So the observations of the most exciting planetary system that we know of, the first planet sucks, but there's still six more to go. And I guess, is this how this is gonna work? They're gonna send us one of these every few weeks, months, and they're just gonna drip, drip, drip the science out to us one at a time. I guess so. All right, I didn't realize it was gonna be a seven part episode, but I guess that's what's happening. So I guess stay tuned for part two. Kazakhstan seizes Russia's assets at Baikonur. Back during the Soviet Union era, they needed a way to launch spacecraft and get as close to the equator as they could. But the Soviet Union was mostly very north. You think about Siberia and other places like that. And so the farthest south that they could get and sort of the right place to launch spacecraft was in Kazakhstan, and which used to be part of the Soviet Union. And then after the breakup became its own separate nation, but they continued on providing launch services for Russia. And so there's several different facilities in Kazakhstan. The most famous of these is called the Baikonur Cosmodrome. And this is the place where the Soyuz spacecraft, the Progress spacecraft launched to service the International Space Station. Roscosmos has been working with Kazakhstan to build a new launch facility for an upcoming new version of the Soyuz rocket called the Soyuz 5. But their debts have gone into arrears because they've been spending money on other priorities like invading Ukraine. They've built up a debt of about $30 million and Kazakhstan has seized assets at Baikonur Cosmodrome. Not the whole thing. This isn't going to have a big impact on sending spacecraft up to the International Space Station, but it has definitely put some constraints on what Roscosmos can do at the facility. They're preventing Roscosmos officials from leaving, and they're also preventing them from being able to liquidate any of the assets at this facility to fund, I guess, the war. So the biggest impact is that this is really gonna put the development and launch of the Soyuz 5 on hold, and we'll have to wait and see what happens if this rocket ever gets off the ground. Rogue planets found in older data. Last week, we talked about this idea of rogue planets. These are free floating planets that are just drifting through the Milky Way. Maybe they were kicked out of an existing planetary system, maybe they just formed on their own out of a small amount of gas and dust to produce its own mini solar system. We know of a few dozen of these rogue planets, and now astronomers have found two more that are quite exciting. They looked through an older survey data of microlensing events where they watch how the light from a more distant star is distorted as a planet or another star passes in front of it. They were able to see two examples of microlensing events, which suggests they're looking at rogue planets. One of these had the mass of about Neptune and the other had about the mass of the Earth. And so they found an example of just an Earth mass planet just freely floating 
in the Milky Way. And of course, if they were able to just find two of them, there must be many, many more out there. Astronomers think there could be as many rogue planets as there are regular planets, but at the very least, about one per star. The machine that's really going to be able to find these rogue planets is going to be the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which is going to be launching in a couple of years. It has a wide field of view. It's going to be looking at a lot of stars, seeing if any of them change in brightness and should send back many, many more of these rogue planets. And we'll get a much better sense of how many of them there are out there. And just sort of follow on that conversation that I had last week. I just I really love this idea that when we think about the future of interstellar transportation going from star to star, the fact that there are as many of these rogue planets as there are stars out there totally changes the dynamics of what it would be like to move from star to star if you could also stop at all of the brown dwarfs and rogue planets and all the other stuff that's floating freely in the Milky Way. China's plans for a lunar base. Ever since China started sending humans to space, started launching more and more rockets, they made it very clear that the moon plays a big part in their future plans. We've seen a series of missions go to the moon, orbiters, landers, rovers, and even a sample return mission, which we'll talk about more in a second. So where's this going? Well, according to some new hints that we got from the director of the Chinese Space Agency's lunar efforts, the plan is to start building a more comprehensive lunar base down near the moon's south pole. Initially, this is more of a robotic lunar base. They're hoping to test out technologies that will let them harvest resources from the lunar regolith, as well as maybe build some kind of radio telescope on the far side of the moon. So it's protected from the radiation coming from the Earth and a lot of other ideas. And they're planning to invite international partners. They've got Russia on board and we'll see other countries coming on board over the coming years. And this is going to lead into a future human base on the south pole of the moon probably sending the first humans to the moon in the next decade, probably by the late 2020s, early 2030s. But we will see over time, this facility just get larger and larger. So it's interesting to sort of see more concrete plans. Traditionally, the Chinese Space Agency releases these sort of five year updates where they explain it sort of great detail what their missions are for the next five years. So we really know what their next couple of lunar missions are. We know they have a mission to an asteroid belt, they're building a space telescope, there's a bunch of other stuff. And then beyond that, their plans are a lot more hazy and, and general. So we're still just getting glimpses of it. We won't really know how this is going to play out until we get that next five year plan from them. Speaking of resources on the moon, we got an announcement from the team working with the Chang of five sample return mission from the moon that they found water trapped in glass beads on the moon. Now this has been seen before when the Apollo astronauts brought back all of their samples from the surface of the moon, they also found that these little glass beads in their samples. And these glass beads are formed when you have these giant impacts on the moon, which superheats the regolith, melts it into these like little spheres of glass that then rain back down on the surface of the moon. And the thought is, is that you've got these hydrogen ions that are coming from the sun that are going into the regolith, they're meeting up with oxygen atoms that are in the regolith, we know there's tons of oxygen on the moon. And these form little droplets of water that are then trapped inside these little glass beads. So some of this stuff was found in the Apollo samples. But the Chinese scientists say the stuff they found down at the south pole of the moon is about three times as much water as the samples that the Apollo astronauts found. And this process, geologists refer to this as basaltic glass. And they know from here on Earth, that in fact, you could get much higher concentrations of water in this glass shards. And so the idea is that you could eventually have some sort of harvesting facility where you're scooping up this lunar regolith, you're crushing it down, heating it up, and you're extracting out this water that the astronauts could then use for drinking for propellant for breathable air, all of these various ideas. So it's pretty exciting that they're finding larger and larger stores of water on the moon and not just at these permanently shadowed craters at the South Pole, but mixed in with the regolith at a wider region leading away from the South Pole. So you don't have to be you don't have to like dig into the ice, just any of the regolith could probably do the trick. Make your own batteries on the moon. 
It is really expensive to launch anything from the surface of the Earth. There was like an estimate that I saw a couple of years ago where they were looking at millions of dollars per kilogram that gets sent to the lunar surface. And so when astronauts return to the moon, they're gonna need all kinds of stuff. They're gonna need vehicles, they're gonna need shelter, they're gonna need food and water and all this kind of stuff. And so that's why there's been so much investment into figuring out ways to make stuff that you're going to use on the moon from the material that you have on the moon. And one of the heaviest things that you're going to need to take with you are batteries. And so a team of researchers have been funded by NASA to develop battery technology that could be created from the surface of the moon using 3D printers. And so there's two main ways of looking at this. One is called material extrusion. And this is where you 3D print the entire battery inside your device, and then you push it out into its final form. And then the other idea is called that photopolymerization, where you can have this vat of battery goo that you then 3D print into any shape that you want. And so what's cool about that is you could then 3D print your batteries into the structural elements of your rover or your habitat or something like that. Your chair could be made of battery. So it allows it to be fit more lightweight, more efficient, more organically designed for what its use is going to be. And you can do that all while you're on the surface of the moon out of the materials that you can find there. Now lithium is actually extremely rare. And so the researchers are looking at a different kind of battery technology called sodium ion, those materials are readily available both on the moon and on Mars. So we can imagine future astronauts going to the moon or Mars, and they take a 3d printer for batteries, and then they fill the hoppers with regolith. And then it just starts squeezing easing out battery material that they can put into all of their vehicles to power their existence on the moon or Mars. Now, if you notice, we try to do the minimum amount of advertising here on YouTube, there's no big long sponsorship ads, there's no ads in the middle, even on our videos that are longer than an hour. If you notice, there's one ad at the beginning, which is the bare minimum we're allowed to do for YouTube, and then nothing in the middle. And that's thanks to the support of our patrons, and not just a minimum amount of advertising here on YouTube, we're able to have a minimum amount of ads on everything we do. Our weekly email newsletter has no ads in it. The we try to remove as much ads as we can from every part of the production. But if you want to go all the way and remove all the ads from everything that we do, you should join our Patreon, go to patreon.com slash universe today. And then I'll give you a code that will allow you to remove all the ads from the universe today website, you can see some of our videos in advance and have them ad free as well. There's no ads in our podcast. So if you want to support the work that we do help us remain independent, help us move away from advertising, join our Patreon, go to patreon.com slash universe today. Europa's ice spins at a different speed from its interior. Now we may know why evidence is building that Europa and a lot of other worlds in the solar system are ice worlds, they have this dense core of rock and metal, and then they're surrounded by a very big ocean of water. And then surrounding that is a thick sheet of ice that has been created because of the freezing temperatures in space. And one of the really interesting discoveries is that the ice sheet at Europa seems to be detached from the solid core of the moon. And so you've got this shell of ice that is freely rotating around at a different speed than the center of the world is rotating. So what's causing this? Well, astronomers now think that there are ocean currents underneath the ice that are pushing around the ice causing it to move around. And one of the other side effects of this is that you'll get these cracks that we see on the surface of Europa. And that's gonna be really good news because one of the big challenges in exploring Europa is like, how do you get down through 10s of kilometers of ice, but you've got this sort of free floating shell of ice that is cracking and deforming and shifting around, then you're gonna have pockets of water that are higher and higher up into the ice, maybe really close to the surface. We'll know for sure when NASA's Europa Clipper launches to Europa, it's going to be scanning under the ice with a penetrating radar system and actually start to map out the locations of water pockets inside the ice. 
And if you're interested in ways that we can get down into the ice, we did a NIAC interview with a team of researchers that are looking to build a new kind of fusion reactor that could melt the ice quickly to get you down under the ice in Europa and really visit the European space whales. Delays for Starliner and Vulcan. While the SpaceX Crew Dragon has been delivering crew to and from the International Space Station, we're still waiting on the successful flights of the Boeing Starliner, which is going to be the other way that NASA sends its astronauts to and from the space station. We had that first test that was actually able to launch and dock with the station. But next comes people. Originally, the mission was supposed to launch in the spring, but now it looks like it's been pushed back into midsummer. And so we got an announcement from NASA this week that we probably won't see that first launch of the Boeing Starliner until July 21st, 2023. It's a couple of reasons for this additional delay. One is to complete all of the flight readiness to make sure they're really ready to fly. They're putting a lot of emphasis on the parachute system, which is designed to slow the capsule down as it enters the Earth's atmosphere and lands. But the other big reason is that Cape Canaveral is going to be really busy over the next couple of months. There's other missions that are flying up to the International Space Station in June. And so when you try to shift around all of the launch windows, July 21st is when they're able to send Starliner. If all goes well, we'll see two astronauts fly to the International Space Station, spend a week or so enjoying the view and then return. And that will be a successful test all the way through of the Starliner system. And if that works, then they'll start to do regular crew rotations with the Boeing Starliner starting in 2024 and probably launching one mission a year to the International Space Station. And it looks like there might be delays with United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket. Of course, Vulcan is ULA's response to the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket system. Instead of having a fully reusable first stage, they've got fully reusable engines. And so the plan is they're going to start with the reusability of the most expensive part, the engines, and then sort of move their way into more and more reusability as they go. We got a tweet this week from Tori Bruno, the CEO of ULA, and he said that they had an anomaly with the Centaur 5 upper stage. We don't know what that means, but he gave the indication that this could turn into more delays for the Vulcan. He said it'll launch when it's ready. So we don't know exactly what the anomaly was. We don't know how much damage it was. We don't know how much delay there's going to be. But just like prepare yourself emotionally for additional delays before Vulcan flies for the first time. All right. Those are all the news stories that we had today. If you want more information, you can find more links down in the show notes down below. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Jay Dennis, David Giltonen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that's all the news for this week. We'll see you next week.